Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks, everybody, for uh, for attending tonight. Um, you are uh, listening in and watching the uh, fisheries information meeting for the Southeast District. Uh, this is one of four meetings we're going to have this week. Um, and if you've attended these in the past, uh, it'll be a very similar uh, similar setup than what we've done in the past where our, our folks are going to give some uh, pretty important and, and informational uh, uh, details and data and updates on, on their areas. So um, my name's Tony Barreda. I'm an uh, assistant division administrator with our fisheries uh, division leading our fisheries management team here. And we have a number of other uh, folks on the call tonight, um, ranging from our division administrator, Dean Rosenthal, uh, and on down the line through uh, a lot of our fisheries and, and even other other uh, divisions within our Game of Parks Commission. So to start out, I just wanted to provide you a general outline for what uh, you're going to hear tonight. Um, I'm going to touch on some statewide updates and some stocking information, and then I'm going to hand it over to uh, the Southeast District crew to provide some district overviews, um, project updates, whether that's aquatic habitat project uh, updates or research project oriented updates, uh, some area fishing forecasts, and then um, the very important thing, our staff contact information. Uh, that we want to be able to have people uh, know about and utilize uh, as they have questions, not only tonight, but uh, throughout the year. So uh, starting with our statewide updates, like I said, we're going to have uh, these meetings going on all week, each one, uh, each district uh, for Monday through Thursday this week. And we're starting with the Southeast District tonight. Um, one thing that I want to uh, make note that we make note of every year are our um, new fishing regulations for, for the year coming up or for the current year we're in. And uh, so here's the list of new things that we have going on. Um, channel catfish, um, we, uh, we had a number of reservoirs that had a one only one fish in the daily bag could be over the 30 inches. Um, and we, uh, in, in 2023 and previous, and we've, uh, we've uh, made that regulation statewide. So now only one fish can be in the daily bag at 30 inches or greater. Um, however, our overall daily bag limits at these waters, whether it's five total fish in your standing waters or 10 total fish in flowing waters and other select water bodies, those overall bag limits still apply, but only one over 30 inches. And then uh, that's really what affects the Southeast uh, District uh, the most. These other regulations with bluegills and yellow perch deal with more of our Sandhill Lakes, um, North Central and North Northwest area, um, uh, implementing some a uh, little bit more restrictive regulations on those panfish species. And then we do have an archery paddlefish um, area below Gavin's Point Dam that we've opened up and uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll hit on that a little bit more in our Northeast District meeting. So those are some of the new things to uh, look for in 2024. You can grab all of the regulations in our fishing guide 2024 online or uh, at your local district office uh, bait shop on um, that sort of thing. A really good really good piece of information to have in your tackle box. Uh, an update I uh, wanted to touch base with you right now is trout stockings. Uh, they're going on right now. Um, they've been going on for uh, over a week or so. And especially in the Southwest dist or Southeast District, I wanted to mention uh, our Two Rivers Trout Lake. Um, we've seen uh, exceptional participation and catch rate so far out at Two Rivers Trout Lake. And uh, we'll, we're, we're expected to see that as we as we continue on. We've had Phenomenal weather, uh, which has contributed to that. Um, and not only the Two Rivers Trout Lake, but we have a number of uh, lakes um, throughout the state that we're stocking trout in right now. And you can access that information at our website. The easiest way is to go to outdoornebraska.gov and then search fish, fish stockings. Speaking of fish stockings, uh, just to highlight some of our 2023 hatchery production, um, Stocking fish is a um, instrumental tool with fisheries management in in our state and in, in for that for that matter all all states. Um, 
in 2023, uh, and pretty impressive numbers. Our our hatchery production uh, stocked out 72 million fish into almost 300 water bodies in 73 counties, and that included uh, 20 different species. Um, to expand that just a little bit more, looking at uh, just to highlight some of our stockings over the last three years, we've stocked uh, 796 different stockings into 379 locations um, that span over 130,000 acres, 191 million fish in, in 30 species. So we are actively um, uh, stocking, producing fish uh, within Nebraska. And it's really a, a huge testament to our production team, our hatcheries that, that work day in and day out to uh, provide these fish for our fisheries. Our youth fishing program, wanted to hit on that really quick. Uh, our, our program specialist, uh, Larry Pape, is putting on uh, a number of different um, clinics, or, or I guess I should say workshops to, uh, to basically uh, instruct youth, youth fishing instructors and, and certify them into the program. They've already had one out in the western part of the state at North Platte, uh, but we have a number of them coming up throughout the, throughout the spring. Um, Larry and, and, and his team and us as a whole um, really uh, are thankful for and rely on these uh, youth fishing instructors to help out uh, not only at fishing clinics, family fishing evenings, expos, but in a number of different ways. And we're extremely grateful for their help. We couldn't do um, a fraction of what we have going on out in the state without the youth fishing program and those folks that are helping out with that. So if you're interested in one of these, uh, Larry and the team could really, they're always looking for more volunteers and more activity. Um, visit our calendar, uh, calendar.outdoornebraska.gov or directly shoot Larry Pape uh, an email and he can get you signed up for one of these. It's a, it's a really beneficial program uh, to us and we are once again, very thankful for that help. Wanted to bring something up uh, that is happening not only in Nebraska, but throughout the Midwest. Um, there's a walleye challenge uh, going on and it, it's, it's, it's more or less a tournament, an online tournament. And the reason why Nebraska is being uh, is getting involved with a number of other state fish and game agencies throughout the mid Midwest, including uh, Iowa, Indiana, Wisconsin, and, and some others, is that not only does it benefit the anglers that participate in, in, a, uh, in this tournament, but it also benefits the state agencies and the provinces, uh, even Canada is getting involved in helping collect data on some of the fisheries that maybe we don't have all of the information that we would want um, from our standard monitoring surveys. So I'm just gonna play a quick video. It's a, it's a short uh, promotional video, it tells you a little bit of details about the program, but we just wanted to bring this up um, as this tournament, um, this challenge starts March 30th coming up. Anglers, the Midwest Walleye Challenge kicks off March 30th, and this year our prizes are no joke. We have over $70,000 in prizes guaranteed across 14 states and provinces. There are rod and reel combos, tackle gift cards, even fishing trips to be won. Plus, the first 100 anglers to register a catch automatically win a $20 gift card courtesy of Discount Tackle. Motor on over to anglersatlas.com to enter today. You won't want to miss it. So yeah, it, it provides a, it, it's going to provide an, an incentive for anglers. You know, you can sign up for this thing with either uh, just without actually paying an entry fee, you would be, uh, you would be eligible for a number of different prize items, non-cash type items, but prizes nonetheless. And then a $25 entry fee that would uh, get you in the um, running for some different cash prizes as well. And like I said, it helps out Nebraska. It helps out uh, a number of different state fish and game agencies to help collect data on our walleye fisheries throughout the Midwest. So, so take a look. Um, QR code is, is on the bottom there, and, and uh, um, you can always reach out to us or anglersatlas.com as well. Anglers, the Midwest.
And the last thing that I have before I'm going to turn it over to our to our uh, fisheries biologists, the ones that are out there really conducting the work and in, in, uh, um, managing these fisheries, uh, collecting the data. I just wanted to provide you with a with a short video. It's only a couple minutes long that one of our fisheries biologists from right here in the Southeast District put together. And it really shows the diversity of uh, work that goes on out there as a fisheries bi biologist and, and kind of what it takes to manage some of our fisheries. It's cold. Not ideal. <laughs> Pike rodeo there. <laughs> oh, he missed. Look at that. So yeah, you kind of get a behind the scenes look at uh, what we do as a as a fisheries team out there to uh, really uh, investigate our fisheries um, and try to uh, improve them and manage them the best we can. Um, so uh, that takes us to our first break in the program. Um, you probably noticed at the bottom of your screen, you can hover over the bottom of your screen and you you'll see a reactions button and a Q and A button. And we want to uh, have folks as they have questions come up, you know, say you saw something in that video that you're curious about, or you have a question about a specific fishery or species or, or project, submit any questions that you have through that Q&A um, Q feature, and we will get to those questions uh, at certain times within the, within the presentation here. We have different breaks uh, as we move from, uh, from panelist to panelist. So um, at this time, feel free to answer or ask a question. You might not get it answered exactly right away. We have some moderators in the background that are putting those questions into different themes, and then we'll answer them as we go. And at the same time, uh, as you can see, uh, a poll just popped up. And within this poll, we're wanting this to be an interactive thing. You ask us questions. Us as a fishery staff want to ask you a few questions as well. So answer those questions as they pop up on your screen. Um, one thing to keep into consideration before you do press submit, we have multiple questions per, uh, per, per poll. So scroll down in, uh, as, you, as you go through the poll to make sure that you've hit question one, question two, and sometimes question three of these polls before, before you do press submit. So um, with that, I will introduce uh, one of our moderators for the night. His name is Jordan Cott. He's a he's a longtime fisheries employee with us, and he um, 
he's here to help us out with moderating some of the questions in the Q&A as well as the polling feature. Thanks, Tony. Um, there we go. Uh, just looking at a couple of the questions that have popped up here. Um, one having to do with the uh, walleye challenge. Uh, can a tape measure be substituted for a measuring board? Um. I will have to look specifically. I am I'm not 100% sure on that. Um if we can if we probably have the the name and contact information for each of the uh unless it was submitted anonymously um of those that are uh submitting questions, we can check on that, check into the details and get back to you. I'm guessing angleratlas.com as you register will have some of those finer details um in print as well. Okay. Yeah, Dean, we'll get back to you on that. We have his we have his name. Perfect. Uh there is an anonymous question here. Um do you allow or have volunteers that come out and uh and help on these uh events and I know uh some of the other projects that uh, the district guys are going to talk about will probably mention a little bit about that. So, I don't know, Aaron, do you want to you want to touch base on on your uh, your volunteer force that you guys have come out and help you with with different projects. Yeah, I can. There's a couple questions here. Maybe we can touch on. So I'm Aaron Blank. I'm the Southeast District Supervisor. Um, we do have some volunteer app opportunities every year. One of those just happened. That would be our Northern Pike Spawn. Uh, we typically in the spring, just for pike spawn, we use about 60 different volunteers. Uh, if that's something you're interested in, um, at the end of the of the uh, presentation here, Jake Werner's email will be up on there. Jake kind of uh, organizes all of that. Emailing Jake and letting him know you'd like to be on the list for Northern Pike next year would be the best steps for that. There's there's no guarantee. It's kind of a the way we've done it in the past. It's kind of a first come, first serve. So Jake will set it up through email, and then it's just a sign up through Survey Monkey or something like that. Um, I did see the one question here too, Jordan, about pike sampling at Flanagan. Jake, you want to give a little talk about that quick? Sure. Um, pike sampling at Flanagan, it was slower than it had been in previous years. Uh, not exactly sure why we did see pike and we saw some pretty darn nice ones, but overall it was, it was a little slower. I don't know if we were late or early or what, or just the weird early ice off or in weird swings and temperatures just kind of got things goofed up and they, they just weren't doing what they typically do, but they were a little bit lower. I know I've seen some questions about the Wadahoo pike as well. Uh, we set 150 nets over five days of sampling at Wadahoo and didn't catch a single northern in there. Uh, that's pretty disappointing, but uh, that's kind of been the trajectory of the fishery, but I won't go into that too much. Jensen will be touching on that a little later in the presentation. Sure. Thanks, guys. Uh, we'll just touch on one more. A lot of the stuff that's been asked right now um, is going to get covered. Uh, and so if 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 it doesn't get covered uh, to everybody's satisfaction, please uh, make a note. But uh, I'll just ask ab about uh, the spring stock trout, uh, the spring stocking of trout and uh, where in the Omaha area can anglers go for uh, for trout? Well, there's multiple. I was pulling up the stocking list here. There's There's been multiple lakes in the Omaha area. One would have been Two Rivers. Oops. What was the wrong thing? Two Rivers Trout Lake would be one that's outside of Omaha. Um, sorry. Get it. 
my screen just went blank here. Jordan, do you want to touch on that while I get this? This thing went kaput. Yeah. Um, so primarily in the spring is two rivers for the Omaha area. We did add a new uh, smaller water body in uh, Gretna, uh, Gretna Crossing Park um, and Halleck Park in the in the spring as well. We really hit the Omaha waters hard in the fall uh, in, in October uh, for spring trout stocking. And I see that uh, our division administrator is also typing an answer out there. So that one will get uh, get covered with exact locations um, as well. So if if uh, you have more questions regarding that, please let us know in the in the box. Louisville 1A would have got a spring stocking too, Jordan. I don't, I don't know if you mentioned that. There you go. Yep. Um, I will just touch base on the uh, the poll questions. Uh, I'll end the poll here and share the results. Um, I'm just looking at this right with everybody else. So about 20, well, 29% are bass anglers and 25% are panfish anglers. So pretty close to even split there for uh, bass and panfish. And then, uh, 17% are walleye, and then it falls off pretty fast. A uh, few catfish anglers in there, a uh, few trout anglers, and uh, and uh, pike, musky anglers. Um, not surprising, not a lot of white bass, wiper anglers, but we don't have a ton of opportunity around in the southeast for that. Uh, what types of water bodies do you mainly fish in the southeast? Um, not too surprising, it's reservoirs. Uh, that's the main water bodies that we have and then when open water fishing what do you primarily fish from uh a lot of bank and uh and a lot of boat a few kayaks so thank you all for participating as tony mentioned we're going to have quite a few more polls throughout the uh throughout the night and keep those questions coming we'll get to to as many as we can during the breaks and then we'll have a lot of time at the end to uh to get to more questions as well you got anything quick tony nope so thanks jordan and and like jordan said if your question doesn't get answered right away they're putting those things they're grouping them so we can answer them later on in the, in the presentation or uh, if we run out of time afterwards via email or phone yeah and it so looks like ahead. Jake, Jake and those guys might be able to answer a few typing in the chat here quick while I'm talking, but we'll get, we'll try to get everything answered that we possibly can. So with that, um, again, I'm Aaron Blank. I'm the Southeast District Fisheries Supervisor, and I'm going to give just a quick update on some projects that we got going on. Uh, first and foremost, again, we're the Southeast District. Uh, we only got 5% of the state surface water, but we have 65. It's probably more like 70% of the state's population now. So we got a lot of high use lakes. Um, everything in our district is man-made. We don't have any uh, natural natural lakes in, in the Southeast district. So just going first thing now to no surprise to anybody, um, we are in a three-year drought, so hopefully we get some rain soon, but we got a lot of low water concerns across the district. Uh, a lot of these lakes right now uh, across, at least in the salt valleys, are three to six feet low. Some, some aren't too bad. Um, some of the Omaha lakes, I know Cunningham and, and uh, Zorinsky are pretty stable. But there's also also areas in Omaha like Weirspan that are about five and a half to six feet low. So uh, just depends on what the watershed is like. But biggest thing is, and when we're trying to get it out to everybody, is just be cautious when launching boats. So you got low water levels. Try to take a good look before you launch. We can't. We're going to try to monitor the ones we can. If you run into issues loading or unloading, please let us know. So we can get that information out there. And lastly, the one thing I would say is if if you're at a lake with low low water levels,
try to avoid uh, power loading. Uh, when we get down to the bottom of those ramps and it's mainly sediment or sand down at the bottom, those power loading can really wash out the bottom of that ramp. And that's when we get that real big edge and drop off off the ramp. So I know it can be an inconvenience, but uh, it would be real helpful. So along with that, I just wanted to, to bring this uh, to light as we've been Zach Horseman, our motorboat access coordinator, has been working on this quite a bit here this spring and winter. Um, we have a boating access interactive map that's online. And I know at the end of this presentation, we will be uh, sending out links to all the participants with the email that you that you signed up with. One of these would, would be this boater access interactive map. It's on the website, but this provides ramp information such as the location, whether it's concrete or dirt. And what we're gonna try to do this spring is continue to update this on, you know, if we have usable ramps, if ramps are unusable. But if you look at here, this is just Wildwood. When you click on the little boat icon, it's gonna pop that little white box up. In that white box, it's gonna have your, your water body name, the ramp type, who owns the ramp. Um, what the parking lot is made out of, those sort of things. And then as you scroll down, and again, the majority of these right now aren't gonna have a attachment photo. We're gonna try to upload as many of those as we can this spring when we're out and about. But the goal of this is to get some photos on there of what the ramp actually looks like, what the parking lot looks like. So when you're launching at a new spot, you kind of know what you're what you're getting into before you get there. So like on this one for Wildwood, if you would click on one of those photos, it's gonna pull up a picture just like this. So the plan is to try to get a picture of the ramp, the parking lot and the entrance on these. So hopefully that'll be, um, you know, it'll be nice and useful for, for people who haven't launched at certain sites. And we just wanted to make everybody uh, aware of this. Speaking of Wildwood, this is, this was a project a joint project with the Lower Platte South NRD. Uh, Wildwood had a lot of issues with the ramp heaving and we had some concrete that needed to replace, but the, the safety issues and some of the concerns in the parking lot with blind corners and the trees overhanging and, and removing snow out of this really caused some issues. And then the other, the other big thing on it was the uh, Lower Platte South NRD really wanted to get a kayak launch in there. And so we partnered and made this project. This is again, what it looked like before. And this is currently what it looks like. So you can see, we, we cleared out all those trees. We opened that up. One, it's a little bit, uh, probably a safer area now. It's a lot more open. Uh, nothing can be you know seen or anything. When you're at the top of the hill, you can see everything. And we tried to utilize this. I know it's been confusing for people uh, who have been out there recently. We've been trying to paint lines, but essentially we tried to separate our, our boating parking and our, our boat trailer parking and our just single stall cars to isolate them. So the highlighted box there would be our boat trailer parking. And then we have our single stall parking. So we have roughly 18, boat trailer parking stalls and 22 single parking stalls, but there's quite a bit of overflow area there also. Uh, again, this is angled parking that we went for, similar to what we have out at Wanahoo. So as you launch your boat and you can pull up right into this area here, as you come around, pull up, back in, and then you can get to this angled parking. So the, the goal of this was so we wouldn't have boats backing right back up into it. So if you're in this first stall, you can pull around and then come all the way around. If you're in the, for this east stalls, you can just pull straight through and go. So we also uh, put in new ADA parking pad and sidewalk. So we got good uh, accessibility now, ADA accessibility out to the pier. Uh, we put a curb on that end of the breakwater. And we also put in some extra rock and grout to hopefully hold that rock in there better. We, like I said, we redid the entire boat launch. And so 
it's a new all new concrete in there and double wide it's, it's quite a bit nicer if anybody's been out there compared to to what it was before in the heaving cement and then lastly we we added this kayak launch down here so now we have a protective kayak launch will hopefully help avoid some of the the boater kayak uh, conflicts at the boat ramp area uh, this is a no parking zone in here. It's just a loading unloading zone. Um, and as we found out this winter, it also works really well for our ice fishermen to launch and get out into that main basin. Moving on to standing bear. Again, we've, we've touched on this before, but I just briefly wanted to, to touch on it again here as we we're about 99% complete with this project. Um, did a lot of work on both the boat ramp area and the north shoreline for sure for angler access. So this was a some drone footage from our uh, from during construction. This is the boat launch facility. Uh, this is now all nice uh, black pavement on here, and we added in a kayak launch facility over here that has some pull through parking, uh, added some breakwaters here for, for protection from a, a east or west wind. And we put in a new double wide ramp there. So launching at an angle on that used to be kind of a pain in the butt the way the old ramp was. This should be a lot easier to just pull up and back straight down. But kind of the highlight of the project here was this north side development and angler access. So uh, we all know the Omaha Lakes get a lot of a lot of shoreline acts or shoreline anglers, and so we wanted to provide the best that we could in this project of of getting anglers out to the lake and have some nice access for families and and kids. And so this is what it currently looks like. You can see we've also added in these rock shoals throughout the lake, not just on this in this area, they're throughout the lake. We have gravel beds. And I also wanted to just give a quick shout out. We had a Eagle Scout project. Um, kid named Connor had, had approached me last year and wanted to do some of these. And, you know, I told him maybe shoot for 20 or 30 because that'd be a lot of work for him. He put in over a hundred of these PVC structures. And so we utilized them on that North bank. Um, so hopefully they won't be quite as snaggy as a cedar tree, but they'll still provide some good habitat for fish to come up, the bluegills and crappies and bass. So hopefully um, these will be well used and, and they fish well, but just wanted to give a shout out because Connor went above and beyond on, on that project, building that many of them. So. And then lastly, just wanted to touch on wagon train. I know if you guys have tuned in the last couple of years, we've we've been talking about this. It's it seems like a project that's that's just never over. But um, we were we've been wrapped up for almost two years now. We just need rain to fill. But we we took over a hundred thousand yards of sediment out of this sediment basin on the way north end. We also uh, added this breakwater in here to, to, to deflect some water, slow it down, and get sediment deposition in there a little bit more efficiently. While the water was low, we touched on this last year, but um, our crew from the southeast, as well as help from our wildlife division, we added in over six, 650 cedar trees for habitat, as well as the rock shoals. We added in a new boat ramp and a new mooring dock and boat dock. And so the projects really came together well, and I think with especially with it being low, it's we're really going to have some some serious fish habitat in there when this thing fills up, and uh, I expect the fishing when it does fill up to be to be really really good. Last thing here before we go to polls, this is kind of part of that poll, and and I wanted to give everybody a visual visual, but. Um, mainly going out to our kayak anglers and, and paddleboard users, stuff like that. Uh, we're going to be talking about this in this next poll question, but, you know, given the choice in launching a kayak or any hand hand launch uh, boat, you know, what, what method do you guys prefer to launch from? So 
we kind of have our shore launch, which would just be a primitive shoreline, whether it be grass or anything like that. Essentially, if there's no no launch facility. And then on number two on the shore launch would be examples of like what we've used at Wildwood and and uh, this other picture is Yankee Hill, but essentially either rock or gravel launches. The third would be the dock launches, the ADA dock launches. These would be what we have at Flanagan and Prairie Queen, Big Elk. Um, or, you know, I know we hear this a lot, was a lot of those, a lot of our kayak anglers and kayaks have, have really changed here over the last 10 years. But, you know, do you need a boat ramp to launch your kayak? Or the last the last one, number five, would be you don't even have a kayak. And, and if you don't have a kayak, I'd like to still have you answer that question. So with that, Jordan, you can go ahead and, and launch some polls. All right, so scrolling through here. Um, can you touch a little bit more on back to Standing Bear about all the uh, additional structure that was added in there? I know you you mentioned it a little bit, uh, but uh, there were there were some trees that were uh, were cut down. Um, just mentioned about future plans that that you got going on for uh for standing bear about uh trying to add some more habitat in there yeah i can touch base on that so that standing bear was priority number one this winter uh, we had planned on getting three to four hundred cedar trees in there while the while the lake was uh low and dry and so we had Typically on these cedar projects, we we work with some bass clubs, and so it takes a little bit of planning. Uh, we had plans set up to do it, and then we hit all of that snow and windy and wind. And so by the time that that drifted, we weren't able to get four wheelers into the areas to pull cedar trees. And and really, we want to use cedar trees because they last the longest of all the things. A lot of that brush that they cleared. Uh, yeah, I understand the the need or the idea of using it, but that stuff really doesn't last more than a couple of years. Whereas we've found cedar trees to last up to 20 years. Um, and so we prefer those cedar trees and there's plenty of them at Standing Bear. So the plan is this next winter, that's kind of priority number one. If we get ice, uh, we'll be out cutting trees and, and pulling trees out there. Uh, sticking with standing bear, can you also touch about on uh, the amount of uh, sediment that was taken out of standing bear and maybe why more wasn't done? Uh, I know that's been brought up on social media a little bit as well and why those decisions were made. Sure. So very little sediment was taken out of there. Um Kind of the the start of this project was was mainly to do a little bit of shoreline work and and redo the boat ramp area. And so, um, what we had was for a pretty minor project after we uh, decided to enhance that north side and get some angler access in there blew up to a it was about a two million dollar project. And part of the issue with removing sediment, uh, especially post COVID, is the cost associated with it. So. Uh, before COVID, on some projects we were we were having sediment removed for seven eight bucks a yard, and once you get into middle of Omaha and you got to haul that stuff out, that triples or quadruples. And so, just basically the cost. I would have loved to take a whole bunch of sediment out there, but it just wasn't in the in the funding sources. So, um, luckily, we still have pretty decent depth in there. Most of those urban waters you know it, it wasn't urban all the time but it, it's got a pretty urban watershed now so those stay pretty well controlled sediment wise once it's developed around there so hopefully we can maintain what we've got in there for depth and and you know we just tried to enhance the habitat the best we could and i think getting the carp and, and yellow bass out of there will will help the fishery a lot too
that, I mean, that was pretty much all the, uh, well, I guess, uh, one question that was, it's not in the, the, the question or the Q and a box, but it was emailed in earlier, had to deal with, um, wildwood and how the decisions are kind of made about keeping areas more primitive and not doing updates to them versus making those improvements to updates and uh, a little bit of the background on how those decisions are made if you want to touch on that yeah and you know we we understand the need to, that people want to have wild places and, and, you know, some of those areas where they can get away from people. Um, and we still have quite a bit of that, even in the Southeast district, there's areas, if you want to get away from people, um, there's opportunity. However, around Lincoln and Omaha, it gets, it's really hard. You know, we try to be uh, the best stewards that we can for everybody, especially for kids and elderly and, and, so we're we're trying to make some of these places that are already popular when we're doing work on them. Uh, we're trying to make it as easy as we can for people to to get in and out and have opportunities, you know, so for things such as bathrooms and and you know, good parking lots, good sidewalks, um, just so everybody can get out and enjoy them. If you want a, a list of, I don't know who sent the question in, but if it's something where you're looking for some opportunity in those areas to get away from people, go ahead and just send me an email and I can point you in the right direction of some, some areas where you're not going to see much for traffic and they're still wild places. All right. Thanks for that. Um, I think everybody should be seeing the, uh, the poll results. So we have a fair number of people that, that aren't uh, paddlers in the group tonight, but uh, we also have a, a fair number, 34%, that appreciate the shore launch, the pea gravel base um, type launches. So that's that's good information to know. I know that's been something we've been striving to, to understand from our users quite a bit. Um, and then the other ones kind of fall out fairly evenly far behind between primitive, uh, the, the larger rock base and the ADA or the and the boat ramp and then scrolling down uh pretty overwhelmingly yes these uh updates do help alleviate congestion at the boat ramp so that's that's very good uh information we appreciate everybody uh, participating there uh once again please keep keep the questions coming uh trying to just address the questions that are pertinent to what was just talked about and then the rest of them we'll get to uh towards the end when we have some more time so thank you with that i think i will be taking over here um so my name's jensen lebsock I'm a fisheries biologist here in Southeast. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, Lake Wanahu. I saw there were some questions in there about uh, pike. Uh, we'll get to that in just a little bit. Um, but I wanna start off with a little bit of history. So uh, this graphic here um, kind of describes how reservoirs uh, typically age. This is from a publication put out by UNL a couple years ago. Uh, when a reservoir is recently constructed, you have this upsurge of nutrients and production. Fish really do well. They grow fast, and you have a really productive fishery in those first couple of years. But as time goes on, uh, this tail um, starts to get lower and lower quality over time. Uh, this has to do with uh, reduction of nutrients. Um, sedimentation is a driver of this. Um, this all just comes with uh, the age. Um, over time of a reservoir. So this is pretty consistent for most types of reservoirs, especially some of them here in uh, the Southeast District. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of Wanahu. We've had a couple high rain events and these are important. Um, in 2014, we had a large uh, discharge there as well as 2019. And in 2019, we actually had those uh, rains over top the breakwaters at Wanahu. Um, 
this is significant because it reduces the water quality and vegetation um, primarily through sedimentation. And the reason that's important is that it's probably the number one driver of aging reservoirs, especially in these systems in Southeast. Um, and so we've noticed this over time uh, since we constructed the reservoir um, in the northern end of the lake is uh, some of our premium pike habitat and where we'd set most of our trap nets looking for them. And we've noticed over time that these have gotten progressively shallower and shallower and shallower. But we never really had an idea um, to quantify, uh, we didn't have a quantitative approach about it, it was just anecdotal. Uh, so we wanted to do a mapping project out here and kind of assess what the sedimentation looked like. So uh, again, started to notice shallower depths, um, especially in the creek channel. So that's pictured here. Um, so this was mapped in June of 2023. Um, we did not map above the weir structure on the northern end. Uh, we just kept it in the uh, northern end of the lake and then the main body of water. Uh, we created a historic and a current bathymetric map. The historic was provided from the consultants when, during the construction of the reservoir. And the, again, the current was collected by us. And then we could compare between those two maps and see what kind of storage loss we've lost. So this is a top-down overview. Um, on the left, you have the historic. The right, you have the current. Um, it's kind of a little bit messy to look at here, but you can see the a really defined creek channel all throughout. Um, but the areas of interest here are on the northern end of the lake. Again, this creek channel was very defined before, and we've lost a lot of that areas as well. And this looks very even. Um, and you can really see where we've lost a lot of that depth. This area called the V had uh, up to 11 foot of death, uh, depth, and now we only have about uh, four to five in that area. This was a, a lot of that good pike habitat. So we've lost a lot of the vegetation and it's really, really silted in as well. Um, so this is the comparison between the two. So uh, again, this is a little messy to look at, but things of note, areas of red have gotten shallower and areas of green have gotten deeper. So shallower means sediment has deposited into those areas. Um, so if we zoom in on the northern end of the reservoir, see that creek channel has lost up to 10 feet, if not a little bit more in some of those areas. Uh, and then to note that some of these green areas uh, have gotten deeper. Well, these were originally cat paws or uh, next to excavations and through wave action that can slough off next to it. And so that could explain a little bit of that. But the main takeaway here is uh, the, the dark red. We've lost uh, a lot of depth in the, the upper end. So what do these numbers look like? So in the whole lake, we've lost about 813 acre feet, which is about 11% of the total storage volume of the reservoir. Um, and then the main lake below the breakwater is the south part of the reservoir. That's about 415 acre feet lost, which is about 7% of that storage. And then this is the big hitter. In the north end, we've lost 398.51 acre feet, which is 26.93% of the storage volume in that area. Uh, the creek channel notably has lost over 10 feet. So along with that uh, aging reservoir topic, again, some of the other topics that increase the uh, uh, rapid aging of a reservoir would be uh, unwanted species. So uh, Wanahu, again, we have, we're seeing that. So we first sampled, comp uh, we first sampled common carp in 2016 uh, and they've gotten more abundant since then. Um, this is uh, not great for vegetation growth. So again, we've lost some of the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can turn that up. Let me, all right, I hope that's a little bit better now. I don't know if, uh, hopefully you guys can hear me a little bit better. Uh, Anyway, common carp, uh, they reduce vegetation growth by how they feed. So they, they root around vegetation, tear it up, they cloud up sediment, um, and this declines water quality as uh, well as removing vegetation, which is important for a lot of our game species. Um, and they also tie up a lot of biomass. Uh, we also have gizzard shad in there now as well. Uh, this was sampled in 2022, the first year. Um, this is a direct competition with larval fish. So fish um, that are stocked as fry or um, reproduced fish in the lake, uh, they'll directly compete with that as well. Uh, they also contribute to a decline in water quality. 
but they do have one positive. They provide a prey base to large predator fish. So looking at the reduction um, of our game species over time, uh, we've lost bluegill density over time. Uh, this is expected with the age of the reservoir, um, as well as these other factors we've talked about, the sediment, common carp, um, the gizzard chad in there as well. Uh, these are going to be impacted the most by um, common carp and gizzard chad. We've also lost a little bit of our largemouth bass density. Uh, we do have a higher size structure. So if you do, if you're angling out there and you catch a largemouth bass, it's going to be a little bit bigger. These are going to be negatively impacted by common carp and kind of a mixed impact by gizzard chad. They're going to be competing as a uh, little tiny fish, but when they're bigger, they have a prey base. So a little bit of extra food on the plate for them. Um, then crappie, they've been relatively consistent over time. They're cyclical spawners. So some years they'll have a boom of production. Some years they won't. Um, they have slow growth in this reservoir. Um, so I'm going to go back a slide here. So this is uh, the data from 2011 to uh, 2021. And you see we have about 100 crappie per net. Um, 2019, we had a large year class that um, recruited to the population. And you can see that it has exploded out there. We have over 600 crappie per net. Um, and so a lot of these are in that eight to 10 inch range. A lot of them like nine, nine and a half inches. Um, so if you want to catch a limit of crappies, uh, I think Matthew will touch on one who's probably your spot to go. But we like to see a reduction of this, uh, uh, this density out there. So definitely harvest away. Uh, and then back over to the Northern Pike. So since uh, the completion of the res reservoir, we've seen a consistent reduction in their density. Um, and this has been pretty consistent with time as those bigger fish have aged out of the reservoir. Um, we've seen a decrease in the size structure as well. Um, and again, this isn't surprising. We've lost a lot of that habitat. Um, the, we quantitated that with... Uh, the sedimentation, common carp rooting up their vegetation. We just don't have uh, a great outlook for pike in that lake. Um, and so we're kind of expecting this, um, maybe not as fast as we thought, um, but uh, this year, uh, as Jake mentioned earlier, we set 150 nets um, trying to sample for them and we didn't see a single pike. So uh, it's not looking great for pike. Um, but walleye have remained relatively consistent. We're going to try and take advantage of that going forward with uh, the gizzard shed base out there. Uh, we see a large size structure, which is good. And these will have a, a likely positive impact. Uh, so we're going to take advantage of this. We've been doing advanced fingerling stockings out there. We're going to start with uh, June stocking of fingerling fish as well, just to kind of boost those walleye numbers, kind of take advantage of the shad in the reservoir. Um, we're going to eliminate northern pike stockings. Um, it's, it was just trending that way, um, so we're going to change management goals a little bit. Um, and then we're going to start channel catfish stocking. These have already been present out there, um, and so now we're just going to do supplemental stocking, kind of boost their numbers, provide that fishery for people going forward. Uh, and then we're going to start wiper stocking as well. We're going to put 130,000 um, fry out there. Uh, just to provide a summertime fishing opportunity for, for people here. Um, typically when a reservoir has low use time. So um, we're going to try and get those to stick and see if we can't create a, a unique fishing opportunity out there, especially during the summer. So just a rec recollection here, we're going to increase walleye stockings. Um, Northern pike are, are off the list for stockings now. More channel catfish. Uh, we're going to start with fry wiper, see how that goes. Um, we're not forgetting about the species that are out there. Um, we're going to continue to monitor largemouth bluegill and crappie and see how those populations trend in the future. Uh, we still do our yearly samplings out there for, for all of those as well. So um, they're not, not forgotten about. We're still going to be, we're thinking about those guys dearly too. So with that, I will uh, open it up to polling and questions. All right. Uh, let's see here. So I guess just make a note here on the in the question and answer box. Um, our staff has been working uh, pretty pretty diligently through the the talk so far to be answering everybody's questions uh, and typing answers out. So a lot of the questions are are being answered. 
uh, and you may have to scroll up because the questions when they do get answered uh, appear in the order that they were asked. So if you asked a question earlier in the talk and it gets answered uh, like right now, it's going to appear closer to the top. So you're going to have to scroll up and uh, and find that answer uh, if your question magically disappeared, uh, just as a, an FYI for everybody out there. Um, one question here that's that's kind of popped up that's uh, somewhat related to Wanahoo and some of the other um, areas that aren't game and parks operated areas is how the funding works on those and why we invest our our time and effort on an area like Wanahoo that's not operated uh, by game and parks. Um, Jensen, Aaron, Tony, any of you guys want to jump in on that? I can, or you can, can Tony, you tell me. Yeah, I can go ahead. Um, our our funding mechanism, so for, for newer reservoirs, is that what the question was asked about, Jordan? Most of the newer being built sort of reservoirs? A little bit of both. So new reservoirs um, and then some of the other reservoirs, uh, a specific one is, you know, one who that has a, a third party feed that okay. you have to enter yeah. into. Yeah. Also, uh, it's not in here now, but uh, the new reservoirs and how we spend um, money on those that aren't operated by game and parks. Yeah. So we do a lot of work, uh, not not only on game and parks areas, but others are our, our mission as a as a fisheries division within within the Game and Parks Commission is the the stewardship and conservation and enhancement of the aquatic resources statewide. So that means that we're going to be involved in uh, the fisheries resources, whether it's an NRD lake, uh, a Game and Parks lake, a uh, public power and irrigation uh, district lake, and and so forth. So we uh, we we invest some dollars in those those um, areas for the benefit of the aquatic resources and the fisheries. Um, and that includes, you know, whether we do an aquatic habitat project, we've done a lot of those on game and park specific areas, but we've done a number of them on some of those other entities areas and, and new reservoirs. We'll, we've utilized a lot of our um, Dingle Johnson Act dollars. So basically uh, some of the fees that are, or not the fees, but excise taxes of your, um, your, Fishing, uh, fishing equipment, boat, motor, fuel, that sort of thing. Um, the excise tax we do, Nebraska gets a portion of that um, in federal funding that we can use on a lot of different fishery projects. And we funneled uh, some of that money towards new reservoirs like uh, Prairie Queen Reservoir, Flanagan Lake, Big Elk Portal, those sort of lakes to uh, enhance those uh, fisheries to make them better for our anglers and and the fish and the aquatic habitat in general. One thing to note on the new reservoirs are that the NRDs and the other entities that are um, the sole or that 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 are the primary sponsor for those projects are expending uh, exceeding amounts of money. You know, millions and millions of dollars, and we're and they allow us to be a small partner in those as a funding partner through through sport fish but also um, to provide technical advice for to make things more angler friendly and more fisheries friendly as well so it's 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 a complex thing but we uh, feel as a fisheries division that it, it is our uh, our duty to uh, be involved in um, enhancing and conserving the aquatic resources not only on our areas but of the of the whole state Most of the other questions it's kind of about what Wanahu and what Jensen talked about is getting handled um via uh, answered in the in the chat right now. So 
make sure you go and look through that chat box and we'll if we have time at the end we will uh try to address some more of those via live answering uh but right now we're going to keep moving on and uh share these results so as far as uh what regulation would you like to see moving forward at Lake Wanahoo with Pike um most people would still like to see maintaining catch and release out there. And uh, the vast majority have not targeted walleye and Wanahoo over the last couple of years either. So that's good information for us. Again, we appreciate everybody uh, participating. All right, I'm Jake Warren. I'm one of the regional fishery biologists for the Southeast District. And uh, for my portion of the talk, I'll be going over the uh, Flanagan Lake maximum length regulations. Uh, we're a little over a year into the implementation of these regulations. So we took uh, aging growth data as well as uh, some of our catch data from crappie and bluegill this year. And I'm just gonna share some of the results of what we've seen so far. I will be starting with crappie and then I'll, I'll move into bluegill a little later. But just to reiterate what the ultimate goals of this project are, it's to make more fish like the ones you see in this picture. Every one of these fish is a, is a different individual that is of master angler size, some of them quite a bit over that, <clears throat> and that were all captured uh, from Planning and Lake. So the goal is to create a trophy fishery for panfish in, in the Omaha area of what, what that trophy fishery ends up being, um, we, we aren't quite sure yet. It's, it's extremely experimental and we're early in those stages, but the, the point of the regulation is to retain fish like these in the lake for multiple people to hopefully enjoy catching and to also build a fishery where you can regularly find these for years in the future. So for our catch rates of crappie, uh, we have uh, crappie per net, on the, on the left axis there on the Y axis, and then on the X is our different water bodies. So we're comparing Flanagan to Prairie Queen and Walnut Creek. Uh, Prairie Queen and Walnut Creek are kind of our uh, controls in this experiment, whereas Flanagan is, is our test lake. And uh, Walnut Creek did have a much higher catch rates than either Prairie Queen or Flanagan, but Prairie Queen and Flanagan have always kind of had tough catch rates for, for crappie there. And we think a lot of that is because of all the offshore structure from the trees that were left in there uh, along the creek channel. The, all that structure that was added as well when the lakes were first built. But it, it provides a lot of structure that could hold those fish in deeper water later into the fall tip when our nets are, are, are fishing. Uh, our nets are, are trap nets that fish along the bank. And typically in the fall, the crappie will move into the shallows and are more susceptible to our sampling years. But all this deep water structure may hold them in that deep water further into the fall so our, our gear doesn't target them as efficiently as in some some lakes but we know that the uh, fishery in Flanagan has a lot more fish in it through our uh, northern pike sampling that we do every spring we get a lot of them as bycatch and the, it, we saw quite a few of them this year so we know that that these catch rates, although they don't look low, aren't necessarily representative of the fisheries that are there. But the numbers are the numbers, so this is this is what we have. It, it might just be the catch rates aren't, aren't a great uh, indicator for density in there, but we'll continue to monitor it uh, through our northern northern pike uh, sampling as well. Looking at our size structure, so this table breaks it down into the proportion of fish six to eight inches, greater than eight inches, greater than 10 inches, or greater than 12 inches. And uh, for Flanagan, we saw that about 90, a little over 90% of the fish we caught were over 10 inches, which is, which is great to see that we're pushing some fish over that maximum length limit. So now those fish are, are protected and uh, will hopefully stay in that fishery and, and provide a, a larger size fish for people to be able to catch. 
But once again, our catch rates were low there in our, in our northern nets this spring, we saw quite a few fish that were also underneath that 10 inch uh, maximum length regulation. So there's still plenty of crappie in there if people want to go there and harvest. And I, I would encourage people continuing to go to Flanagan and harvest fish. We will need that, that harvest continually going on to maintain, to try to push that into a low density fishery and maintain a low density fishery in order to increase our growth rates and, and, and get bigger fish. But Prairie Queen, uh, they had a really good sample, even though the catch rates there were low too. Uh, we saw quite a few fish over 10 inches with a decent amount over 12 inches as well. And then Walnut Creek has kind of always been one of our better panfish lakes in the Omaha area. And this year, it, it continued along that trajectory where nearly 40% of the fish that we sampled were over 10 inches and there were quite a few uh, over 12 inches as well. Uh, looking at condition of the fish, when we're assessing condition of the fish, we use a metric called relative weight or WR. Essentially, it's an, it's an equation that we can put the fish's length and weight in and it can tell us how plump the fish is. And so when we're looking at WR, we're looking for values typically between 90 and 110. If you're seeing values below that 90 mark, uh, you know, getting into the lower 80s, that's indicating that those fish are uh, a poor condition. And uh, that poor condition could be impacting growth. And so right now, the uh, crappie at Flanagan and Walnut Creek, they're as healthy as can be. Uh, 100, the WR 100 is, is really good, pretty satisfactory. Prairie Queen's getting a little low. They're averaging right around 90. It's not conserving yet to the point where we think it could be impacting growth, but it is a little bit lower than the other lakes. So digging into growth on these real quick, uh, we're we're looking at the, the uh, crappie and Flanagan right now. And there's basically one year class that's dominating these. And so we can follow their, uh, their growth trajectory. And uh, at the beginning, they had pretty explosive growth up until about three years old. And then growth started to, uh, to slow down a bit, which is fairly normal for our populations. But uh, when comparing it to Prairie Queen, which is the green triangles here, uh, we see that it's following a pretty close trajectory to the, the crappie that we see in Prairie Queen. But another thing I wanna point out is we can see here, it takes on average about five to six years to grow a 10 inch crappie in either of these lakes. So I know there's the, there's the perception that these fish are faster growing and in, in some, some more Southern reservoirs and lakes, they can be really fast growing. There's lakes in Texas that put out 13 inch crappie in, in a year or two, which is pretty incredible, but we're far, further North, we have colder winters and uh, not as long of growing season. So our, our growth rates are gonna be a little slower, but uh, even our uh, you know 12 to 13 inches that we see out of, out of these lakes are gonna be eight, eight, nine years old. So those bigger fish are, are pretty old and that's kind of another reason we wanted to protect them in Flanagan is it takes a lot to get those bigger fish and uh, we just wanna keep as many in there for, for people to enjoy. And then comparing Flanagan to Walnut Creek, Walnut Creek actually has quite a bit quicker growing crappie in it where they tend to hit that 10 inch mark at about four years old. So pretty interesting dynamics that you see there. Um, some of the reason that the Walnut Creek might grow a little quicker is it it's kind of a lower density fishery as is compared to some of our other lakes like Weir Spanders or Inski that have really high densities. This this lake always maintains a little bit lower density in it, and that could be one of the contributing factors amongst others that as to why it uh, it has a little bit better growth in it. But but even then, those those bigger fish, those twelve to thirteen inches, are still seven, eight, nine years old. So. Once again, those bigger fish are, are pretty old fish as well. But I'll switch gears real quick and we'll talk about the bluegill that we found in, in these lakes as well. Uh, looking at catch rates, uh, our catch rates are pretty variable. So the, the point in the middle of those bars is our mean catch rate and the uh, bars represent our uh, standard error. So there's a lot of variability. You know, we can have some nets that are packed full of bluegill and then some that catch just a few and that contributes to high variability. But even with that, our means were anywhere between 40 and a little over 70. So they're still all pretty, pretty high density fisheries for bluegill. Once again, looking at our size structure, where here we have proportions in the three to six, inches, greater than six inches, greater than eight inches, and greater than 10 inches. 
Uh, we see that both Flanagan and Prairie Queen are having struggles producing fishes greater than eight inches. Whereas Walnut Creek this year had a phenomenal sample and 40% of the fish we sampled were over eight inches and we even saw one bluegill that was over 10 inches. So it's really special to see those, those master angular bluegill in those Omaha lakes. Looking at condition, once again, we're looking for values between 90 and 110, and all three lakes produce those, those values between 90 and 110. There is, once again, a little bit of variability, but none of, none of which were low enough to be concerned about the health of the, of the fish that are in there. So once again, I'll start out with, you know, when looking at growth, we'll start with looking at Flanagan. And uh, right now, it, we haven't sampled very many 8-inch fish out of there. Most of them that we are seeing are, are going to be, the bigger ones are going to be around seven, seven and a half inches. But when comparing that to Prairie Queen, once again, we see just about the same exact trajectory in our growth as in Prairie Queen as we got at Flanagan. Uh, but once again, what's interesting is looking at the growth of these fish, and it takes a while to produce an eight inch bluegill. We were at a conference this spring that one of the symposiums was talking specifically about panfish and it was a conference where there's multiple states from all over the midwest and kind of the consensus was an eight inch bluegill is kind of kind of a benchmark that, that we need to sample against and eight inches is actually a pretty darn nice bluegill so it, it in our in prairie queen and flanagan it seems that it takes quite a while to grow them and in flanagan we might start seeing them in the next year or two and if it continues along that same trajectory as Prairie Queen, whereas Prairie Queen, it, it seems to take about six or seven years to produce an eight inch bluegill. When comparing it to Walnut Creek, it looks like Walnut Creek has a little bit quicker growth rates where they are reaching lengths about a year earlier than they are at Flanagan and, and producing eight inch fish at about six inches or about age six, sorry. But what's really interesting is we didn't sample many fish that were, you know, more than eight and a half inches long. Most of them are right around eight inches when we did get them, but they've continued getting older without uh, getting much bigger. So there could be some really interesting interactions going on there. We, we aren't sure what, but hopefully we'll, we'll be able to tease it out in the next few years. Could just be that with Walnut Creek being an older reservoir, it's had a, more opportunity to stockpile those eight inch fish that take quite a while to grow. It could be that once they, you know, start hitting those nine inches, they're, they're more likely to be harvested. So there's just a lot fewer of them in there. We, we aren't sure. It could be those factors. It might not be. It could be several other factors added on. But we're excited to continue this project and, and learn more about these fisheries and hopefully learn if uh, the maximum length regulations are going to be effective or not. I know you, you talked a little bit about Prairie Queen, Jake. Um, what do you know about, uh, oh, I guess I misread that. I thought it said a cat for a cat fisherman, but just uh, overall for fishing in Prairie Queen, what can a new angler expect for, for uh, fishing Prairie Queen? Probably going to catch a lot of bluegill and a lot of uh, red ear and a lot of their hybrids. The bluegill and the red ear are highly hybridized in there. And, uh, well, looking at the growth rates, a lot of them are, you know, are going to be smaller. It's going to be harder to find those larger fish. But there is quite a few crappie in there. And, and like I said, there, there, can, there are some pretty nice ones in there. But there's, there's going to be a lot that are stacked up in that mm, around 9 inches, 9, 10 inches. Uh, the, the walleye and the catfish in there are both doing really well. We had really good samples for, for both of those fish in here. I'm going to. See if I can pull up the data real quick so I can look at it while I'm talking about it. Um, yeah, this year for walleye, we were at just under 14 fish per net, which is which is really phenomenal for our lakes. Our goal is about eight fish per net, so we're definitely exceeding that. And uh, this year, we also had several that were over 25 inches for walleye in there. And the, which is phenomenal. So the, the walleye fishing is doing really well. The reports through the ice and into the spring is people are people are catching them. So 
you want some walleye, that'd be a good place to go. Uh, catfish are also doing really well. I heard reports last fall that people were catching quite a few cats through the ice as well. Uh, recently, the, the bass numbers have been, have been going down a little bit. We're not sure if that's, if that's because the bass population just isn't what it was. We aren't sure if they're just not there when we're sampling, if all that offshore habitat is, is pulling them off, or if we've just had bad weather on, on the days that we've been out there to sample it. There's, there's multiple factors that can be, that can be contributing to that. But even with our lower catch rates that we are seeing out there, we have seen improvements in size structure where every year we're getting more and more quality fish, more and more preferred fish, and we're starting to see some memorable fish show up as well, which can be some of the trade-offs that you can get where when you get a lower density bass fishery, you tend to get bigger bass. So we're continuing to monitor it and, and uh, if, if changes need to be made, we'll adjust, it, adjust accordingly. All right. Uh, while you're hypothesizing there, uh, back to the crappie, a uh, couple questions. Um, there's a kind of a plateau of, of growth. Uh, do you think that's food availability, habitat, genetic? Um, what's, give us your thoughts on that. And then also um, why the, the quality at, of those crappies may be uh, less at Prairie Queen compared to uh, your steady lakes and then some of the other other area lakes in Omaha. So, so I'm going to ask the person who said that maybe you could follow up by quality. Do you are you talking about condition, their condition being lower, or just the size structure being lower? If you could throw that in, that'd be great. But uh, as far as forage, there's there's a lot of forage in there. There's a lot of little bluegill and and other things in there that that those crappie can eat. Lots of macro invertebrates and everything. I don't think it's a, it's a forage issue as to what's what's hampering growth. Uh, it could be a couple of things. Uh, the genetic side of it, it's that there may be a component in that it's it's really the genetics, especially when it comes to growth, can be be a tough thing to tease out. But what it would more be is, is as they hit sexual maturity, they switch that growth from being somatic or, or bodily growth into being gonadal. So their their gametes, that you know, their eggs and and uh, everything that's going to what, what that energy is more more targeted for instead of, instead of bodily growth so when you see that trajectory kind of peaks and then starts to level out that's a lot of that you know going out versus somatic growth going on as well but uh it could also be that the density of those crappie in in prairie queen are pretty high as well and it could just be that that competition amongst each other, that interest specific competition it is high enough to where it's hampering those growth rates as well. So once again, that, well, we kind of hope to tease a few of these things out and, and hopefully we learn more as, as this project continues. He, he just chimed, Mike uh, just chimed back in and was referring to the uh, WR. Yeah, yeah. So once again, I mean, the WRs are a little lower, but they're not to the point where it's concerning. And once again, it could, it, it's probably more of a factor of uh, competition than anything else in there. Uh, but but it's really, it's really tough to say to pinpoint one thing so that that's the cause of why these ones are down. But, but once again, those values that are, you know, in the low 90s aren't aren't concerning. Uh, the values that would be start to be concerning are, you know, low 80s into the 70s. That's when that's when things would be concerning and, and really starting to, to impact your growth rates. But thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Um, take a look at this poll here quick. Um, so the regulations at Flanagan impacted your decision to fish, uh, fish there. Uh, 62% say no, they have not impacted. Uh, 35 say yes, they they have me want to fish there. And uh, 3% are uh, yes, they have made me not want to fish there. And then would you support the implementation of more restrictive regulations uh, similar to Flanagan on other water bodies? Very similar to what we saw last year when we asked this, this question, 82%. Uh, said yes. Let me pull up what uh, uh, we were at 80. Uh, no, that's the wrong question. It, it was right in that same ballpark last year of uh, um, high or uh, low to mid 80s for uh, 
um, yes, for more restrictive regs similar to playing again last year. So very much supportive for uh, trophy-type regulations in the Omaha area. As they're uh, as they're getting the next presenter uh, um, squared away, I just want to uh, mention again that we'll have uh, we'll have a follow up email that comes out to all the participants of this this meeting um, that will provide some of the links that we've talked about today. Aaron talked about the the boating and boat ramp information um, link and interactive map. We have a public fishing um, areas interactive map stocking database um our all of our a lot of our data um, um survey summaries and uh, for individual water bodies and regional type fisheries um is on our website as well at outdoornebraska.org and and we'll provide a, a list of different links and, and information to be able to uh be able, be able to have in in at the tips of your fingers so be looking for that email uh after this meeting sometime in the next week or so jordan maybe you can hit us with a few more questions here if Okay, looks like Matthew's got it going now. Okay, there we go. So I'm the uh, <clears throat> kind of last leg of the journey here. I'm also a fisheries biologist with uh, Southeast District, charged with managing lakes here around Lincoln and uh, Omaha. And so we've kind of been talking about a current theme here for a little bit kind of throughout the presentation. And so I'm gonna kind of dive into a little bit more of the, uh, kind of like the management behind or like the philosophy behind some of the crappie harvest and kind of what we'd like to maybe advocate for or just kind of put into people's minds a little bit when they're out there uh, targeting crappie specifically when they're harvesting them. So this is kind of a hypothetical situation, but pretty common for a lot of people probably when they're out targeting crappies in a lot of the area lakes where you just see this kind of increased abundances where some of these smaller fish, you know, fish less than eight inches and kind of like the eight to 10 inch range. And as you start getting into those larger size, size ranges of crappies, you just don't see as many of them. And that's pretty, pretty indicative of a lot of, a lot of our area lakes. And so something that Anglers, you know, could think about doing a little bit more is kind of some of that size selective stuff. And so, especially with crappie being a cyclical spawner, you know, they get the conditions right, they have high fecundity, or they can like produce a lot of produce a lot of fish, produce a lot of eggs, produce a lot of fish in, in a hurry, you know, and kind of been talking about that at Flanagan a little bit, and of course at Wanahu as well. And so they have ability to be very reproductively successful. When you do that, you kind of get some of these bottlenecks. So some some ways to kind of work around some of that, you know, talking about maximum life limits and different things like that too, where a lot of that harvest is kind of focused on some of those larger fish and, and why wouldn't it be right? Like the bag limits 15, you want to go home, go home with uh, some of those larger fish, you know, just bigger, bigger bang for your buck or what, what you want to call it, you know, for the quantity of the flays and things like that. But yeah, as I was mentioning, you tend to kind of get a little bit of a stockpiling potentially, and that's, kind of harvest induced, but it's probably largely reproductive induced too, which is the conditions within those crappies. And so once you get so many mouths on these like smaller ones, they can 
develop some density dependent growth or there's not enough growth juice to go around essentially. And so you start to get the stockpiling at some of these smaller size classes and they kind of tend to bottleneck a little bit. And so don't, don't be afraid to, when you're out there uh, doing your crappie angling to, if you're catching a whole bunch of eight to 10 inches and just a couple of those 10 to 12s or 12 plus, like take a bunch of those eight to 10 inches home, you know, and come back the next day, of course, stay within your possession limits, but that's actually going to help out the fishery quite a bit. And so like, I know there's kind of a paradigm too, like, well, if I put this fish back, then it'll be there next year and it'll continue to grow. But that's not always the case. Like sometimes harvesting fish, taking some fish out of the system can actually like reduce some of the bottlenecks to where the fish that are still in the system can grow better, grow quicker. So that's just kind of something I wanted to kind of talk about, get, get in people's minds a little bit. So, so harvesting some of those smaller smaller fish and then the, some of the small fish that are still in the system can push through you get some of those larger fish that people are people are targeting and looking looking to catch and with that we kind of alluded to a couple of them but crappie spawns just just a month away here a little bit i know a lot of people are already going out and having a lot of success with this warm spring that we've been having a lot of a lot of crappies have been caught which is great great to see great to hear and so, yeah, people that are looking to go out and harvest a lot of crappies where we can use some more harvest at are the ones I have mentioned over here. Yeah, Wanhu Flanagan, talked about those quite a bit. Olive Creek, kind of south of Lincoln here a little bit, and we're expanding Zrinsky and Omaha. So real quickly, going to kind of go through, a, highlight some of our work that we do over the course of the year, too. I kind of talked about this the last couple of years, but we're, when we're going out and evaluating these fisheries, we're doing standard surveys. So we're using different gears based on the species that we're out and trying to target. And then we culminate all that information and we make it all public. This is all available. And so a lot of this is within the fishing forecast. You know, we got the pamphlet brochure that's also available on outdoornebraska.gov, along with some uh, specific kind of tailored regional reports that uh, Jake and myself make too. So yeah, there's a statewide fishing forecast. And we also have the yeah, Lincoln area forecast, just kind of lakes, obviously kind of within the name around Lincoln and then some around Omaha as well. So just to kind of highlight some of the fisheries, you know, have it a little bit more focused too. And then we have it broken down by species. And so just going to highlight some here. I'm going to go through uh, bass, catfish, and then talk a little bit about sawgai and walleyes. Of course, we're out there sampling crappies and bluegills as well as we've been talking about. But just for the sake of time, just going to move through some of this. But again, this is all available. Feel free to reach out to us as well, too, if you have additional questions. We're out on the lakes all the time. And so we can we can steer you in the right direction. So there's some of our sampling effort. Yeah, we did 18 lakes for bluegill, 18 for crappie, 29 for largemouth bass. Put a lot of effort in on those electric fishing 2023. 14 lakes for channel catfish and gillnets, and then eight lakes for walleye and five lakes for Kind of going to move through this fairly quickly. As I mentioned, a lot of this is available in those reports and just for the sake of time, but just kind of want to highlight a couple. So Louisville 2, kind of a more recently renovated reservoir as long as, or sand pit, and then Cunningham as well is really coming on after that renovation in 2019. High high density, lots of bass. And they're growing as well too, lots of 12 to 15, and some are over 15 inches already. So lots of that's good bass fishing to be had in Omaha area. And Lincoln, um, yeah, Hedgefield is still kind of keeping up with the zone and doing really well out there. Bowling, Meadow Lake, Stagecoach would speak. Some good lakes to target as well. These are a little bit lower. So as you're all well, well aware, which is kind of the drought and lower water levels, a lot of our historical sampling locations where we're going along, we had like, you know, Rock River up shoreline or uh, different cedar trees or just Habitat more conducive to where the bass were going to be at, but because a lot of those lakes were so low, we were kind of running our boat along just like mud flats that didn't have a lot of habitat. So that kind of biased some of our sampling results. And so I'd still be fairly confident in the uh, proportion of the lengths of the fish exhibited here, but maybe not so much the uh, overall uh, abundances and numbers of fish. Kind of switching gears to catfish and Omaha area. Lawrence Youngman, Wirsch Band. Again, these are just lakes that were sampled in 2023. Like we have different yearly rotations for different lakes based on their priority. And so we have a pretty good gauge on different catfish fisheries beyond what we're just listing here too. Lincoln area, East Twin, we actually get some 
quite a bit of natural reproduction, as you can kind of see here from the from the graph. We do stock a little bit too, although we did pull that last couple of years. But East Twin would be a great and continue to be a great, great place to go catfishing around around the Lincoln area. And Walleye Saga, yeah, Cunningham there in North Omaha is just reaping awards of that renovation as well. Like kind of off the off the charts. Jake and I kind of joked a little bit about it. We could have made it off the charts if we <laughs> made the graph a little bit, but yeah, over 25 per net out there. And people have been really taking advantage of that. And this this spring, when they uh, get closer to the spawn, the, the dam's going to be a really good, really good place to target those. Then yeah, stagecoach as far as Lincoln area, Yankee Hill, Jekyllin, lots of good places to target the wall. And we also have some saw guys. So Olive Creek, Big Indian is another one that's not included in here. That's doing really well. Pawnee's got some really, really large fish in it too, as you kind of see on the measuring board there, but they're doing really well out of our area. So that'll kind of move through that fairly quickly and open it up to the next tier questions here. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Um, one thing you didn't uh, talk about wipers uh, too much, but uh, what can you mention how wipers are doing in uh, Pawnee? I know we've stocked some wipers there uh, fairly recently. Any plans to continue that uh, stocking and how they're doing in Pawnee? Yeah, unfortunately, they're not doing too well at Pawnee. They're doing uh, quite a bit better at Branch Oak, actually. We've been pretty excited how well the Wipers have been doing at Branch Oak, and we might be trying to uh, stock stock some additional fish out there in the future. But when we're out there doing our sampling at Branch Oak, they're getting to be you know fifteen to twenty, and we're getting quite a few over twenty inches as well. So they're they're doing really well out there, but yeah, unfortunately not not so much at Pawnee. I'm trying to remember how many we caught per per net out there, but not as not as well, unfortunately. And. Uh, as the guys have mentioned too, you know, their contact info is going to be coming up here towards the end. So always reach out to them, uh, throughout the year, whenever, if you have specific questions like that, they're happy to, to chat with you for hours and hours. Right. Uh, um, and, uh, and give you that information. Um, another one here, I know you mentioned a couple of the Louisville lakes that were sampled, uh, just talk about, uh, how the Louisville lakes are doing overall. Yeah, they're they're doing really well. And yeah, I guess Aaron can chime in on this too a little bit. But yeah, we had to kind of go through systematically and renovate quite a few of them, just like the flood and flood in 2019. We got a lot of uh Asian carp, specifically silver carp out there. And so we did a bunch of systematic renovations out there and then restocked them with bluegill, bluegill and crappie into some of them, and then bass as well. And it's been doing really well. The last bass have really taken off to where we're kind of almost Wonder if we got too many bass in a couple of them, but yeah, overall they're really kind of coming back online compared to what they were doing. The water quality's returned to. I know some of the lakes when they go out there in the spring, we can see down almost ten feet in some of those. So, yep. and just to tag along on that, uh, Jordan and Matthew, we we do have a uh, aquatic habitat project that's going to be going on out there this spring so if you see some work out there we're going to be adding in some artificial fish habitat they're going to be doing some ada access we're going to replace the boards on all of those fishing uh, piers and bump outs as well as put a few more in um, and probably the biggest thing from a fishing standpoint is we're going to excavate some material out of the shallow corner in Lake 1A, that shallow corner, that's always kind of that icky, sticky mud. And then we're also going to excavate around the north fishing pier on Lake 2. Um, in the past, we've had issues with vegetation growing up there, so that pier is, has been kind of difficult to fish off of. So we will be doing some excavation there. So if you see people out and about, that's, that's what's going on. touch base because Matthew brought Cunningham up which is a recently renovated water body uh and this kind of deals with renovations and regulations any thought or I guess give your thoughts on utilizing uh restrictive harvest regulations on those new 
renovated or or in in your guys's case uh brand new water bodies for a, a longer period of time after they open up to fishing versus just allowing harvest right off the bat and what goes into those uh thought processes yeah you know it all depends we've we've had we've had good things happen with catch and release and we've had some things that weren't so good happen with catch and release um you know you look at wanahu that only sat still there for about a year um and again we've seen a lot of harvest coming off of that but we've seen really good growth rates on those fish afterwards at at flanagan as jake talked we have a real high density of bluegill in there and you know i i wonder sometimes if we didn't have the catch and release regulation on there if we if some of those fish would have been pushed and harvested if we'd we'd be able to push those fish through faster um, i'm not 100 percent sure everything's a little bit individual when it comes to these lakes but you know, as far as as far as restrictive regulations like we have at Flanagan, you know, one thing why we're doing this maximum length regulation is to see if it works, right? And so if this is something that's real successful, it's definitely something we would look to implement in other lakes. Um, but we're always trying to learn different things. You know, catch and release uh, isn't always the best thing for a fishery, as Matthew talked about on some of those crappies. There's a balance there of of keeping fish and protecting fish, and you know we're we're always trying to provide opportunity. We have people who like to catch 13, 14 inch crappies. We have people who go out there and all they want to do is catch their limit uh, to eat. We have people who go out there and who just want to catch fish and release fish. And so you know we try to be we try to provide that opportunity for everybody. And you know plan again specific that was kind of a regulation that was this started to you know give a little bit to our our more avid anglers who have been drawn for for more restrictive regulations and, and larger fish and so uh, we'll continue to evaluate all that and we'll go from there all right thanks uh I'm going to introduce uh, Christopher Starr. He's our Aquatic Invasive Species Program Manager. Uh, we had uh, a couple questions regarding uh, aquatic invasive species. Uh, the first had to deal with uh, private water in uh, southeast Nebraska, and the second had to deal with um, various aquatic invasive species uh, other than common carp. Uh, so if you could uh, maybe not list all of them, Chris, because I know you could uh, – probably fill up the rest of the time slot with uh with aquatic invasive species but uh list some common ones that everybody listening should uh, uh be aware of um and then also about what to be looking out for when it comes to uh, zebra mussels yeah sure um so you know some of the other main um, aquatic invasive species that we're worried about um you know sort of like uh, Jake mentioned are white perch um, silver and big head carp, also known as Asian carp, um, and then also some of our crayfish species, such as rusty crayfish um, and white river crayfish. So those are sort of the main ones that we're worried about. Um, but there's also a host of others, you know, with, with invasive species, things come um, from, from uh, pretty much everywhere. And, and as far as zebra mussels, you know, um, I like the, uh, the question on Beaver Lake, you know, it's a little um, difficult because it's a, you know, you have a, a private water body, but, you know, we have our um, aquatic invasive species technicians out doing watercraft inspections, the number of uh, water bodies in the Southeast District. And to kind of be on the lookout for, you know, you know, what we're really worried about is there's this kind of common theme that zebra mussels can, you know, only spread through adults, but the primarily way they spread is actually through their microscopic larvae called villagers. And these can stay viable um, in, in your live well, in your boat motor, in your bilge for several days, even outside of the water. So that's why it's really important to make sure everyone uh, cleans, uh, drains, and dries uh, before uh, going from one water body to another. So the best way you can prevent um, the spread is by always following that clean, drain, dry technique from, from one water body to another. And then we all are also uh, worried about some of our um, invasive aquatic weeds, such as Eurasian watermill foil and curly leaf pond weed, 
Um, you know, we started sampling a number of our water bodies in Nebraska over the past couple of years for some of these invasive weeds and 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 we're hoping to do a lot more um herbicide treatments on some of these invasive species um sometime in the future. But if you ever have any questions, um you can always contact Gaiman Parks at ngpc.ais at nebraska.gov. Uh, very good. We, uh, as you were talking, I had another question pop up about how our uh, zebra mussels are, uh, I guess, not doing, but uh, I guess how are our waters fighting the fight and how are how are you and your army of techs um, doing <laughs> against the uh, the invasion? Yeah, um, that's that's a great question. You know, a number of our water bodies, we sample monthly during the uh, their spawning season. So from about May through September, uh, I think last year we sampled over 70 water bodies every single month. So we then take those water samples back to our lab and actually look at every single one in the microscope, one milliliter um, them at a time. So it's a very time intensive process, but we do the, uh, those checks to help catch an infestation early where our, our options may be um, a more open if we catch one later down the line. So that's 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 one way that we really employ an, um, an early detection technique um, to kind of catch infestations early. And then for this, you know, stopping the spread, you know, it's really the public is 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 the best to prevent the spread of these invasives. So um, if you kind of look at the map of zebra mussels across the Midwest United States. South Dakota, um, Iowa, and Kansas are becoming pretty well. Um, you know, a number of their water bodies, them in the dozens, are infested by zebra mussels. So we're kind of the last state in this line um, that doesn't have widespread zebra mussel infestation. So the best we can do is to keep vigilant, you know, try and get this message out to the public. Um, you know, keep doing these watercraft inspections. You know, we, we really appreciate when folks um, are cooperative during these inspections. I, I know that they can be kind of a pain, um, but we do our best to try and check every single boat, you know, um, uh, when the inspector is present before entering the water body. So that's the best that um, the best kind of strategy for preventing this spread is this clean, drain, dry, dry, like I mentioned before. Very good. Uh, we do have somebody. Uh mentioning that they they they're pretty sure they saw phragmites at rockford uh in southeast nebraska so I, I you mentioned it earlier but just maybe reiterate uh if somebody is thinks they they find an invasive species just mention again how they can report it uh so that you get that information sure yep yeah, if you see something say something that's kind of our best um you know our best model that we have so you can email um, the Gideon Parks AIS program directly at ngpc.ais at nebraska.gov um, or give us a call at 402-471-7602. All right. Thanks, Chris. If we get any other questions, uh, I'll call you back in. Appreciate it. Um, so a couple other ones i know this one is brought up earlier um well i guess i'll i'll jump to this one aaron have you or uh about a share lunker program for i'm um, bass like uh some of the southern states have and uh maybe touch on some of the stuff that uh we're doing as a as a division in that regard yeah so the share lunker program up north I mean, it's, I haven't heard of any other states that don't stock the Florida strain largemouth that, that have been doing it. Um, typically, I don't think we're going to have that, all that genetic um, issue up here. We're, we're only, we're only able to support northern strain largemouth bass. So I don't, I don't expect any share of lunker programs up in the Midwest, um, just because those one, our growth rates are slower with than what they are in those Florida strain bass, but you know we're really confounded just by our growing days too. So, uh, are there any restrictions? Again? 
against using uh, belly boats or float tubes and uh, swim flippers on uh, public lakes? Nope. Just be careful. Make sure you're make sure you're wearing something visible if you're going to be out, especially where there's any power boating. On the uh, essentially allowing fish to be sunk in public waters and why that is not allowed. Either you or, or Tony. Tony, do you have a little more insight on that? I, I kind of know a little bit of the background, but I'm not sure if you know much more on like the NDE standards. Yeah, we've had, um, I know in the past there's been conversations and this this was kind of with, uh, we know other states have uh, actual fish cleaning stations that are based on a dock out on the water. Um, and there, there are some regulations, state regulations that aren't under uh, Game and Parks Commission's regulations or statutes. Um, I think it's more on the water quality side that do prohibit that sort of uh, slit and sink sort of thing for uh, game fish, non-game fish, that sort of stuff. So we're, we're, uh, we're confined to some, some regulations and potentially even statutes re related to that. Um. Uh... Thank you for that. Any thought about, well, I guess, can you touch on what the bag limits, uh, possession limits are for AIS type species and uh, what the regulations are, um, either Aaron or Chris, uh, either either one? Because there are there are some specifics that that be, go beyond just what what the bag limits are and what how you can possess them yeah like big the biggest thing in our district would be the white perch and something that we implemented there a few years ago uh would be as essentially you you are not allowed to be in possession of live white perch whether it's in your boat or in a bucket and so um you know we do have some lakes that well, there, there's a lot of different lakes here in the southeast part where guys can harvest white perch, but we do have some too where you can go out and harvest all that you want. Wildwood would be a good example of them. You just got to make sure everything is dead. If you're going to keep it, kill it right away and then put it in the live well or put it in the bucket. I don't know, Chris, if you got any more, Jordan, you got any other information you wanted on that? No, that that was the main thing. Like what you said is that they can't, they cannot be alive. And and to reiterate, there's there is no no bag limit on on those. Um you can you can take as many as you as you want. Uh they just cannot be alive. Uh another question here. Uh regarding some AIS and, and more management. Uh, so we do know there are some, some folks that enjoy fishing for carp. Has there ever been thought to uh, maintaining a fishery that is just carp based and managing it as a, as a carp fishery? Well, you know, one of those things there's, I wouldn't say there's been any real big push to make a, a specific lake for carp management. However, even in the Southeast southeast District, we have a few lakes that are probably going to sustain carp for a long time that aren't going to be subject to renovations. Branched Oak would be a good one. Uh, that thing, I, do, I don't see a future or near future renovation. Uh, you know, some of our larger reservoirs and then also our river systems um, will support carp for a long time. And so, there's opportunity there, but as far as like a specific carp lake, uh, the only one that we really have in the district that that and we don't do a whole lot with it anymore would be the uh, Two Rivers Six, and that's been kind of some subject to some some different plans. Uh, the low water here the last few years has about drained that, but at one point that was stocked with carp and and just only carbs so that might be something we revisit in the future but if there are carp or if that thing dried up and the carp are gone out of there there's a possibility of making that into a, a different fishery too 
Um, question some well, a couple questions regarding river um, access and water. Uh, do we as game parks kind of look to add river access points? Um, specifically along the Big Blue in Missouri, and do we have any uh, control over how much water gets pulled out of there via irrigation or anything uh, in that regards? And I realize that some of that comes on to me as the private waters person, but I'll since I'm asking the question, I'll let somebody else answer it. Yeah, I can I can start with it is, uh, you know, river access it, um, as most of everybody on this call knows, uh, Nebraska is 97, 98% privately owned. And so um, a lot of our rivers and streams are uh, owned on both sides by, by private landowners. Um, we've increased our river and stream access over the last 10 to 15 years through our open fields and waters program, which is a kind of a a lease program that that is provided by our state agency to uh, landowners that allow uh, folks to um, either hunt, fish, trap on their property, and it could be any one or a combination of those. So we uh, we definitely have those um, sites um, on our minds, and as those situations come up, we look at providing more access via that way. Um, it's just one of those those things where um, a lot of that is it, it can be very difficult. But we have made made some strides here in the last ten to fifteen years in that sense. Um, in regards to uh, water levels, you know, um, I know the the question was was commenting on uh, the blue big blue river and maybe the little blue river as the as the uh summers go on and water's withdrawn it can become very difficult for kayaking um keeping kayaks and canoes afloat um that's that that's one of those things that we deal with uh in our water rights um sometimes when water levels get very low actually some of our producers in nebraska get shut off because some of the senior water rights are either downstream or even in Kansas. Um, and so that's a first in time, first in right uh, sort of thing with our water rights. And, and we have uh, very um, little to do with that. It is It can be very unfortunate to see some of those rivers get very low, um, but that's kind of um, what we have to deal with with some of our water policy and water rights in the state. Uh, Tony, while I got you, I uh, know you, you'd messaged me that you have an update on the uh, question regarding the uh, walleye challenge and what you can use in regards to a uh, measuring device, if you want to touch base on that. Yes, I got a, a, a email from one of our uh, biologists, Keith Copel, that has kind of taken the lead on this this project. And he checked into the rules a little bit further, and they say an approved. Uh, the rules say to use an approved measuring device. This includes a measuring board or tape measure that fish is clearly lining up with the nose of the fish, and all numbers are visible on the measuring tape. So, um, in this instance, yes, a, a, a measuring tape can be used. It just that that picture has to uh, has to show that front end and and the back end and all the numbers visible. Um, so I know this, this question gets asked every year, uh, about law enforcement and what's, what's an update. Um, I know Tony, you've, you've sat in on, on some of these with our law enforcement. Uh, do you care to touch on an update or if you have an update on where our law enforcement, uh, status is across Southeast Nebraska? Yeah, I, I, I know for the state as a whole, we're trying to hire more more law enforcement officers. Um, that's that's first and foremost. And um, where they're placed um, is based on priority by um, by administration on on how those are placed. We know that um, the southeast part of the state, especially some in some of these urban areas, are um, uh, that 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 
require a lot of enforcement, especially with some of these uh, new regulations, these these trophy type regulations, restrictive regulations that are getting placed on urban water bodies. Um, and I know there's multiple new law enforcement officers or in training in, in training right now um, that will be distributed throughout the state. And hopefully, I mean, uh, as we talk about Southeast District here in this meeting, hopefully we'll uh, be able to gain gain one or two in this part of the state to uh, to fulfill some of those duties and, and enforce some of the laws out there. I will tell you one thing, the law enforcement officers that we do have in this part of the state, um, even though it might not seem like you see them very often, they're they're working their tails off out there. Um, and and feel free, even if you don't see them, and, and we try to emphasize this, um, use that Wildlife Crime Stoppers um, number um, reporting tool. Um, in our fishing guide, we have all of our law enforcement officers' numbers directly there. Um, they they are as responsive responsive as they can, and uh, uh, give them a call or or let them know when you see something out there. All right. Um. Well, let's see. So, uh, just scrolling through some of the questions that have been answered, there's a few about uh, um, big elk in portal and the the smallmouth bass yellow perch in there um obviously unique fisheries to southeast nebraska uh aaron or your your guys do you care to touch base on that briefly yeah so far you know really big elk's been the 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 mainstay i touched on it last year with portal uh right now the papio nrd is is working with an engineering firm on portal, they're still monitoring it. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And and as I said last year, at this point, they're they're pretty sure that no water is is going out the bottom of the reservoir and, and down, you know, where there'd be a hole in the dam or or we're we're dropping straight through. Um, the plan right now is get out of this drought, get enough water in there, and then once that water gets high enough, that'll help that evaluation. They can start to see what's going on. Um, as far as anything in the future, um, you know, this is something, again, kind of an experimental stocking. These, these are possible because there's nothing up above those watersheds or in the watersheds. There's no ponds up there where we got bass and bluegill that we have to worry about coming down. And so, you know, any future lakes where uh, we have similar situations, this will be, you know, definitely something we entertain and we we're glad it's working so far. We'll be out there here in the next few weeks, probably doing some perch and, and uh, bass surveys. So, uh, Jordan, Jordan, if you or Matt, you don't mind, this is just one thing I wanted to touch on quick. I know we got some bass fishermen in there, but would one of you two give us just a quick update on the on the bat, Black Bass Management Committee and kind of what's going on? Yeah, I could jump in here a little bit. So, yeah, kind of over the past year, we've kind of been keeping it largely within within the biologists here working in Nebraska and just trying to kind of ascertain a lot of information, a lot of historical perspective. Like we have quite a few bio biologists or district supervisors that have been working in the state for 30, 30, 40 years. And so just a lot, of, a lot of information, you know, a lot of institutional knowledge. And so just really kind of like getting all that information into one place and just trying to get that into a situation where we can kind of go through it and learn from, you know, past man management objectives and things like that, too. And so we uh, created a survey. Jordan and I worked on it quite a bit and had input from Tony, a lot of other people, too, and kind of just sent that out to a lot of the uh, biologists working on working on the fisheries here in Nebraska. And so we just kind of get, get a lot of information gained from that. And then moving forward with that, we're working on some potential public involvement as well. And in regards to a survey as well. So moving forward, there'll probably be a survey available available to the public in the future. And so just trying to really just gain a lot of information at this point. You know, we're reaching out to a lot of other area states too. I probably mentioned this before, but yeah, nobody that works in fisheries is in the silo or working, working on things by themselves. You know, we're contacting biologists in Kansas and Iowa, South Dakota, and you know, kind of across across 
across the uh, country really and just developing these things too. So just kind of gain a lot of information at this point and then kind of moving moving forward from there. So, oh, Jordan's got more to talk about that. I, I just wanted to tag on it too, Matthew, just to let people know uh, Matthew's actually going to be going down to the to the Bassmaster Classic here in the next week. They have uh, they have a group of other biologists that go down there and have a big symposium about black bass management. And um, we were happy Matthew was able to go and, and excited to see the information that he gets working with those other state biologists. Yep, yeah, a lot of tournament focused presentations. It looks like and kind of you know managing that and what that looks like and a lot of the excitement that's generated from that so excited to go to Tulsa Oklahoma very good yeah I don't I don't have anything to update there Matthew covered it covered it perfectly uh from my point of view so uh appreciate that uh, I know we had a couple other questions here pop in uh right at the end we'll We'll address those uh, to those individuals via um, email that you signed up with. Um, with that, I'll just thank everybody for your uh, participation this evening and uh, throw it back to Tony and, and everybody else. Thanks, Jordan, and thanks, crew, for putting on a uh, informational presentation here. And and uh, especially thanks to everybody that that came out and listened and participated uh, today. It was, I mean, we had over, we had over 90 questions uh, out there, uh, a few that we will reach back out to folks um, that had individual questions or that we didn't get to them here. Uh, but a lot of great interaction. It shows the, it really shows how interested and passionate you are about the, the, the area resources here. And, and, uh, we are we are as well and want them to be the the best they can be so thanks for thanks for uh tuning in we're going to have these these uh series of meetings the next three nights at at uh, with the other districts and be looking for a follow-up email with some informational links uh youtube links to uh to the recordings of this and um don't don't be shy reach out to this crew as you have questions uh throughout the year so thanks again. Yep.